the owner of Calypso Salt and Soap. Each batch is handcrafted by me, and when I started, I really didn't want to make just ordinary looking soap. I'm pretty artistic by nature, so I wanted my soaps to reflect me and be artistic looking as well. In my soaps, I use all natural colors and oxides, as well as micas, and that creates the beautiful colors and effect in each batch. Each batch is completely unique, and no two batches are alike. My soaps each have special recipes of olive, coconut, cocoa butter, shea butter, mango butter, castor oil, and a few others that make each bar creamy, thick with bubbles, and they don't get mushy in water. This makes for a really good hard bar that's long lasting. Along with all these oils, I've added essential oils, which make them very good for you too. Things like lavender or lemongrass, even Things like activated charcoal added to the bars, very good for your skin. After I tried my hand at Renaissance Fairs here in Florida and the outcome was amazing. People loved my product. Don't forget to come out to the Florida Renaissance Festival at Quiet Waters Park on Powerline, February 7th through March 15th and meet Taylor Ash in person, surrounded by all of her beautiful soaps. That's February 7th through March 15th. Talk 1470, WWNN, Pompano Beach, Boca Raton, Miami, Fort Lauderdale. This is Talk 1470, Talk 1470. WNN. Youthful Savings creates and delivers innovative financial education products through a virtuous approach in order to disrupt the cycle of poverty. We provide affordable college planning solutions through our financial freedom web application and program, youth financial education and entrepreneurship training through our My Own Business Challenge curriculum and program, and group youth programs that teach entrepreneurship and financial education. Ten cents of every dollar earned is reinvested into the community saved through the Youth College Scholarship. For more information, please go to www.youthfulsavings.com, email at info at youthfulsavings.com, or call 646-504-7164. The opinions expressed on the following sponsored program are strictly those of the host, guests, and callers, and not necessarily those of this station, its staff, management, or sponsors. Welcome to We Are The People with Tracy Marks and Jorge Estamba, who ask you to know what's happening with your student loan. Tracy and Jorge keep a deep look at student loans in this country and the industries that surround it. Every week, We Are The People will bring you new insight into the corporate welfare industry, such as bailouts, and they connect with student loans. The show will highlight on your constitutional rights and how the current system is built to infringe upon them. Join the conversation by visiting our website chat room at wearethepeople.tv. Or call the show at 888-565-1470 and let us hear from you. And now, let's tune in to Tracy and Jorge for this week's discussion. Hello, Rick Stroll and the host here again tonight. Hope you're having a great evening. Lots of stuff going on. If you want to get in uh, and talk to us on the show, that's always welcome. Phone calls are welcome. 888-565-1470. That's 888-565-1470. Feel free to call in if you got questions or things that you want to discuss or suggestions for things that you would like to have us research and discuss. Perhaps we can get some guests on uh, to discuss those very items. Last time we talked about uh, H.R. 449. Causes wanted us to support that House bill. Uh, what is it? Basically, it's a very simple bill until they mess it up in Congress. But the idea is to discharge student loans in bankruptcy. It's called the Discharge Student Loans in Bankruptcy Act of 2015. Talk to your congressman, talk to your senators, because hopefully Congress will pass it and send it over to the Senate. But especially talk to your congressman and line up support for this bill. Our rights in bankruptcy to discharge debt from student loans were taken away from us. Congress passed bills in support of the industry to take away our rights 
and make student debtors, student loan debtors, second class citizens if they make us citizens at all. This bill purports to restore those rights, to restore the right of discharging student loan debt and bankruptcy. If you're like me and have lots of student loans, student loans that you got under the aegis or under the idea or were sold under the concept that the debt that, the, that you were generating to get your education would be more than offset by the jobs that you are going to get as a result of having that education. If you found out that those jobs didn't exist or that you couldn't get those jobs and are saddled with debt, like the albatross around your neck, this is very important because you can discharge that debt in bankruptcy. And that's what bankruptcy was for. It was uh, provided as a right of the public to be able to get a fresh start, a new start when mistakes were made or problems were incurred that were essentially too hard to overcome, that you could clear your debts and be able uh, to start over again, to start afresh and to begin your life. Mm -hmm. So H.R. 449, Discharge Student Loans in Bankruptcy Act of 2015. Talk to your congressman. Email them. Call them. Call their offices and track it. Find out where they're at. Get them to sponsor the bill. Simple bill, not much to it. Of course, it kind of pokes the eye of uh, the corporations that are holding this debt but we need to get something done. We need to get this passed, all right? Um, you know, there's an article, there are a bunch of articles on student loan crisis, student debt crisis. Uh, we had the State of the Union address in Student Debt Crisis, which is an organization. Um, they like the suggestion in the State of the Union of two years of free college. But where is that free college going to come from? Got to come from the people, isn't it? Yeah, we talk about taxing corporations. Where do corporations get their money from? They get their money from passing along their costs, including taxes, to the people. Right? Who are these taxes funding? They're funding the government. Now, we have a country that was based on, that was created to give the individuals the liberty to make choices in their lives, to live their lives, to choose for themselves how they're going to live their lives. You know, we talk about the Declaration of Independence. If you haven't read it, read it. You know, that second paragraph, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that to secure these rights, this is critical, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it's the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safetyness and happiness. You know, that's Declaration of Independence, foundation of this country. And yet we've got government continually growing. You know, has anybody besides me um, gotten the feeling that government treats the people like a herd of cattle to be milked and slaughtered for its own sustenance? That's the opposite of what the founders thought that they were creating. They were minimalists as far as government was concerned, as far as central government was concerned. Their ideas were to minimize the control the government had over the people. The government that they rebelled from wanted to have very minute control, complete control. It was a monarchy, and the king had control and made changes. 
and cut the people out, cut the colonists out, cut those people who were theoretically Englishmen, and yet the Americans had lived on this continent and were operating under local governance. The crown came in and said, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to have you pay more taxes. Now, to be fair, you know, in that instance, the crown had paid a lot of money to fight the French and Indian War, to protect the colonists, to protect the colonies. You know, there was certainly some legitimate interest there in terms of recouping those expenses and having the colonists pay a fair share. We hear a lot about fair share and whatever that is. Okay? But when you've got 1%, the 1% or 5% of the people paying 80 to 90% of the taxes, is that a fair share? We all aspire to become part of the 1%. Maybe not all of us, but a, certainly a lot of us would not buy, mind finding ourselves in that position. And yet government has come in and is taking those funds. What does government produce? Produces lots of regulations, lots of rules. Yeah. But we've got to be careful that there's a balance. And I think the balance has been exceeded, where the government now looks at the people as its sustenance instead of being the servant of the people. It looks for the people to serve the government. Yeah. You know, the people bailed out the corporations not too long ago. Six years ago, it's time that the government and the corporations bail out the people, help the people, work on behalf of the people, in favor of the people. Mm -hmm. Student loans is one area that is important mm -hmm. because we have studies that tell us that billions of dollars, even billions of dollars have been taken out of the marketplace especially the new home marketplace, the housing marketplace, okay? the economy. Okay? Well, it's the economy that drives what we can afford to pay the government in taxes. It's the economy that provides for the government. Yeah. We've got people asking for forgiveness of student loan debt. Why? Because when the marketplace was deregulated, when the student loan marketplace was deregulated, the schools... And the lenders, they combined, and they told students anything, and they promised anything, and yet those promises haven't come true. So it's time for the industry, the schools, and the lenders to help the students, to provide for them. You know, what is our government doing? We've got an issue here with Internet freedom. The FCC is looking to regulate the Internet. Well, the Internet is our avenue for access to each other and for access to different points of view and for access to information. Why would we have the government regulating it as a common carrier? Not a good idea. Government should stay out of the media. Government should stay out of the Internet. Keep its hands off the Internet. The whole purpose of the Internet was to allow people to communicate and for ideas to be transferred and for people to be able to consider the ideas that others have and perhaps even ways of implementing them. Okay. So protect the Internet freedom. We have uh, protectinternetfreedom.com is asking for your help. Protectinternetfreedom.com is asking for your help and contacting your members of Congress, senators and members of Congress, congressmen, and also the commissioners of the FCC. Tell them to keep their hands off the Internet to allow it for what it was supposed to be, a free exchange of ideas. Mm -hmm. So talk to them. Protect Internet Freedom. ProtectInternetFreedom.com we also had an organization that wanted us to support 
the opposition to fast track. What is fast track? We're talking about um, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, another free trade agreement. Well, what does free trade do? We have installed in our laws in the United States all kinds of restrictions. Why? Because we like clean air. We like clean water. We want to make sure that waste is properly cared for and taken care of and doesn't get into our environment. Those things are in our law. Right? Those things make manufacturing more expensive in the United States. When you have free trade, that allows goods created elsewhere, products created elsewhere where they don't have those restrictions to bring those items across the border without being tariffed, without consideration for what it is that we have put in our law. If it's good enough for us, it should be good enough for everybody, shouldn't it? If we're trying to lead the way on clean air and clean water, on safe products, on health and safety in the workplace, on health and safety in the community, on child labor, on slave labor, if we're trying to lead the way to prevent those types of things and have a better standard of living for the people, why shouldn't other countries do the same? And if they want access to our marketplace, which is still one of the leading marketplaces in the world, if other countries want manufactured goods to be able to come here and be sold here, they ought to do it on our terms. But if we create free trade agreements that allow them to come and put anything that they've made outside of our philosophy, outside of our laws, into our market, what does that do? We get cheap goods that end up killing our industry because manufacturing is more expensive here because we care about the environment. We care about people's health. We theoretically care about how people are taken care of after their working years are over. Those things are supposed to be in our laws. They are in our laws. They're part of our philosophy. Why do we allow products from other countries that have slave labor, child labor, that don't care about the environment, that dump all kinds of dirt and waste products into the environment, that don't care about clean water, that don't care about paying for those things? Why should we allow them to place their products in our economy and to destroy our manufacturing, which does care about those things. Again, very important. Email your representative to oppose Fast Track because Fast Track allows the administration to do pretty much anything that they want, regardless of what is in our laws and regardless of what is in our interests. We've lost millions of jobs to free trade agreements across the world. Why? Because manufacturers, corporations go offshore, go outside of our country in order to be able to manufacture their goods more cheaply and increase their profits in our marketplace. All right? So talk to your representatives, email your representatives, call them, ask them what they're doing to oppose Fast Track. Why? Because we want to make sure that our values, the values that we've incorporated in our laws, are respected. What else we got here? We talked last time about uh, uh, the Climate Depot report. Look up the Climate Depot. Find out what they're talking about. All right? You know, we have all kinds of propaganda that bombards us on a daily basis. All kinds of people want to influence us to do all kinds of things. And there's the climate change industry. Well, guess what? Climate change has been with this planet since the very beginning. Climate change has been with us always. You can tell, you know, we've got some intense global warming coming on. You know, it's really affected us this winter and previous winters. Climate changes. All right, well, we've got record snowfalls. It's cold in some places, right? Climate is what climate is. And unless Congress passes a law to put a thermostat on the sun, which is the principal arbiter of our climate, we've got problems. But instead, what have we got? We've got 
changes that people want to make, the government wants to make, to tax the people, to make energy cost more. Well, is that progressive? I don't think so. I think that's regressive because it affects those least able to pay the most, right? So lower class, middle class are going to get affected. When we destroy the coal industry, we're the Saudi Arabia of coal. When we destroy the coal industry in this country, you know, much of our power is generated currently by coal-fired plants. We spent a lot of money. Corporations have spent a lot of money. They've passed those costs along to the consumers to clean up the effluent, the output that comes from using that methodology, from using coal. All right? But if we destroy that industry, not only do we destroy jobs that are based on the industry, but we increase the cost of power, the cost of electricity, because much of our electricity is created using fossil fuels. And fossil fuels are still abundant. Why not use them? Our country, our economy is driven, the world economy is driven by fossil fuels. Now we could go back to the Stone Age, and that's going to kill a lot of people. That's going to reduce the standard of living that we've worked hard to increase over the centuries, over the decades. Yeah. So why are we doing this? Because some people can make a lot of money off of it. Some influential people, some influential corporations can make a lot of money by going to those changes. And that further subjugates the people. It reduces the liberty of the people to care for themselves, to make choices in their own lives. It brings us back to a feudal state, to a state of feudalism, where only the most powerful are able to live according to their dreams. And the rest of us are subject, are subjugated to them economically. Mm -hmm. So talk to members of your government, to representatives and senators, and let them know that you want them to support the liberty of the people and to support the things that are good for the people, not necessarily the things that the corporations and the oligarchs want to have, the ruling class. We don't have a ruling class here. The founders created a class that did not have a ruling class. They created a society that did not have a ruling class. They did that on purpose to liberate the people so that the people could make the choices that they want to make for their own lives. But you have to be educated. You have to understand what is going on in this environment. Senior Americans Association, right? We've got issues. We've taken, this government has taken trillions of dollars out of Medicare, they bankrupted Social Security because they spent the money that we paid in as a regular part of our paychecks on a weekly basis. We paid this money in to insure us so that we would have something to fall back on for our retirement when we were no longer able to work. Well, guess what? The government's taken all that money. There is no lockbox. There is no trust fund. It doesn't exist. So we're dependent on current workers to pay for those of us that are retired, those of us uh, that are dependent upon what it is that we thought we were saving, that we thought the government was saving on our behalf. Mm -hmm. Talk to your congressmen. Talk to your senators. Talk to lawmakers. All right? Stop them from seizing... Social Security to pay past debts. Right. Stop them from taking your taxpayer refunds and from taking the dollars that are government payments to people on Social Security to pay for past debts, student loan debts, other debts. In many cases, this is all that these people have to live on. And in effect, the government is crushing these people, grinding them up and spitting them out. 
you know, there's more than a trillion, hundred trillion dollars, right, in unfunded debt, in unfunded obligations because of the Social Security business and because of Medicare, right? Wouldn't the government like to just get rid of those obligations? Wouldn't it be smart for the government to do that? And how would they do that? By getting rid of the people, getting rid of the people to whom those obligations are owned. So you, you got to think about those things, right? You got to think, why are we reducing Medicare? Because we want to get rid of those people and we don't want to have to pay for their benefits. Well, those were promises that were made and promises that were paid for by taxes that were paid. So those of us that may be on Social Security or getting close to getting taking Social Security or needing Medicare, those things have been paid for, and yet the government is stealing them from us because it wants to spend money elsewhere. Right? You know, we've got to be careful and understand that we've got a system of government here that was put here very deliberately. Our Constitution is a document of limitation. It limits what the government should do and what the role of the government is. The proper role. Yeah. And our president and our lawmakers, they take oaths of office. Yeah. You know, the legislature is number one on the runway in terms of Article One of the Constitution. That's primary. The legislature is supposed to legislate. It makes the laws. It changes the laws. And we have opportunities to influence that by communicating directly with our legislators. But all legislative powers in Section 1 of Article 1 of the U.S. Constitution are granted and vested in the Congress of the United States. All right. When we come to Article 2, we start talking about the executive branch led by the president. Well, the president takes an oath of office. The president is responsible for what? The president is responsible right, under the oath of office to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Well, what is being preserved, protected, and defended in this oath, in this Constitution? What is the responsibility of the executive? To make sure that the Constitution is observed, that it isn't changed or modified by the executive branch or forgotten altogether. Right? In Section 3, the president shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed. Well, who creates the laws? Who makes the laws? Congress makes the laws. The president, the executive, the executive branch is responsible to make sure that the laws are faithfully executed. And I don't mean by executing, killing. All right? They have to be observed. They have to be maintained. They have to be properly executed. When you've got a president that does what he pleases and an executive branch that creates more laws and more rules in rulemakings, that's improper. Congress is responsible for doing those things. Congress should not abdicate its responsibilities in doing things. And the president should observe and execute those laws. Right. If you've got questions, read the Constitution. Read the amendments. Understand how this country was founded and why it was founded. Understand the history. I understand that those things are not commonly taught in schools these days. Right? We'll see you next time. You have been listening to We Are the People with social advocates Tracy Marks and Jorge Estamba who every week bring to the light the needs and changes in our current system. Tune in every Monday night at 7 p.m. on wearethepeople.tv and participate in the conversation in the chat room or call 888-565-1470. Tune in next Monday for more information and facts. And Tracy and Jorge remind you to stay aware of your surroundings and challenges at all times.